Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today, we're gonna to have a chat about one of my favorite subjects, the E6B flight computer. Now, I've been promising a full tutorial on this for the last few weeks, and this is gonna be it. So, let's cue up the music and learn about the whiz wheel. Now, as a student pilot, we didn't have YouTube videos at the time, so I had to learn all of this from books. It's gonna be a little bit easier for you today. Now, if you do go on YouTube and you look up the E6B, what you will find is a series of videos generally, each talking about one specific function of this flight computer. There's nothing that seems to bring it all together, and that's what I wanna to do today. I'm gonna to go over the whole E6B in one episode. So. Let's go ahead and zoom in on the E6B and learn a little bit about it. Now, the first thing that you have to do is see how it's constructed. Well, this is one side of the E6B, and it's got two wheels on it. It's got an outer ring, which is fixed, and then it has an inner ring that's movable. If you saw any of my videos on slide rules, you'll recognize that this is a C and a D ring. The movable one is the C ring, and the fixed one in black here is the D ring. Now, just like a slide rule, if you want to multiply two by four, for example, what you would do is put the index directly over the two on the movable C ring, and then you would read on the black ring out to the four, which is at about the seven o'clock position, it says 40, and you'd read straight down. Now, even though the answer says 80 here, because we're multiplying two by four, and it's 20 and 40, we realize that we have to drop that last zero and the answer is eight. Now a real life example for a pilot using this would be to figure out how much aviation gasoline would cost for a particular trip. So we'll move the index on the movable C ring underneath the price of the gasoline, which is $5.50. That's at the nine o'clock position. And if our trip is going to take 25 gallons of fuel, what we're going to do is we're gonna come around to 2.5 which is at about the two o'clock position on the white ring and read straight up. And as you see, that will be about $137. To divide using this, we can easily just reverse the procedures. Well, we're gonna take 70 and we're going to divide it by two. And the way that we would do that is we would take the 70, bring that over to where the two is, and then read under the index at 12 o'clock. And as you see, the answer will be 35. So that's the slide rule function of the E6B that does multiplication and division. Now we're going to do some of the specific aviation functions. So let's go back down to the E6B. Now that black triangle there is called the rate index. And as you see, just to the left of it is 55 and just over to the right is 70. 60 minutes, of course, is one hour and that's very useful to us. Now, as an example, let's look at my fuel burn rate, which is nine and a half gallons per hour. So in 60 minutes, I'll burn nine and a half gallons of fuel. How much fuel will I burn in an hour and a half? Now, if you go out to about the two o'clock position, you'll see 90. And directly under that, you'll see one hour and 30 minutes. If you follow that mark from one hour and 30 minutes up, you will see that I'm going to burn just over 14 and a quarter gallons of fuel. If you check that on a calculator, you'll see it's right. So let's just say that our maximum trip that we wanna plan is going to be three hours flight time. How far can that be from our home base? Well, let's go ahead and do speed calculations. They're very similar to our fuel consumption calculations. We're going to put the rate index under the one. Now, what is our speed in that twin engine plane? Let's say it's 160 knots. How far can I go in three hours? You should be able to do that in your head, but we can do it very easily. Now, if you go over to about the eight o'clock position, you'll see that three hour mark on the inner ring. If you follow that out, the large hash marks between the 45 and the 50 are 10 nautical miles, and the small hash marks in between are five. 
and that looks like about 480 nautical miles. And if you do the math for that, 3 times 160 is indeed 480. Now our next calculations are going to be related to density altitude. Now density altitude is an interesting thing and a very important concept for pilots to understand. Now the reason for this is that your aircraft does not know the elevation of the runway you're sitting on. It knows the pressure altitude that it's in. Pressure altitude is what the aircraft uses to fly. That's how the lift equations are calculated, etc. So we have a standard atmosphere. A standard atmosphere is 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. And the pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury, 760 torr, or I believe it's 1,016 kilopascals they use in Europe. Now any change in temperature or pressure changes the thickness of the air, so to say, and also changes the lift generated by the wing, the takeoff roll, and your rate of climb, etc. So for example, if I have an aircraft that under standard temperature and pressure would require 1,000 feet for a takeoff roll at sea level, if I take that to Boulder, Colorado at 5,400 feet, if it's a particularly hot day in the summer in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm well above 59 degrees, say I'm 90 degrees, I'm going to need even more takeoff roll. And there's going to come a point with elevation and temperature where I'm not going to be able to take off at all because there's just simply not enough runway for me to generate lift. Now with landing, a similar problem occurs. If your aircraft takes 1,500 feet to land at sea level, that means that you're hitting the ground at a certain ground speed and you can stop in 1500 feet. Well, if you're at very high altitude on a hot day, the actual speed of your aircraft over the ground will be faster and you will require more landing roll to stop safely. We can calculate all of that with the E6B. Now let's go back to the E6B and see how to do these calculations. Now just above the center point of the E6B, you're going to see three windows. The one on the left says for altitude computations. In the middle we have density altitude. And on the right we have true airspeed and density altitude. Now I've got it set so that the density altitude is listed as zero. This would be a sea level airport. Now if you look to the right, the true airspeed and density altitude window, you'll see for that density altitude the temperature would be 15 degrees centigrade. Notice the zero is directly under the 15. Now at the top of that gauge, you're going to see temperatures. They range from plus 50 to minus 50 with zero in the middle. The zero pressure altitude is lined up with 15 degrees centigrade. You'll see that there's a large hatch mark and then a small hatch mark. That's 10 degrees and then the small hatch mark is 15. Now if I raise the temperature to 25 degrees at sea level, like so, you'll see that the density altitude is listed at just over 1,000 feet in the middle window. Likewise, if it's 20 degrees at 5,000 feet, the density altitude would be 7,000 feet. Now before landing at an airport, you tune your radio to the airport's ATIS, which is its automated weather reporting channel. And on ATIS, it'll give you the direction of the wind, it'll give you the visibility, it'll give you the barometric pressure, and it'll give you the density altitude. That and the airport elevation is how you plan your approach and decide whether or not you can land at that airport. Now another computation you can do with this same setup is something called true airspeed versus indicated airspeed. The airspeed indicator, of course, gives you your indicated airspeed. Well, what is your true airspeed through the air? Because that indicated airspeed is calibrated to denser air down at sea level. If you're up at 20,000 feet, you need to know the outside temperature in order to determine the density of the atmosphere at that level and do a conversion to find out what your true airspeed is, which is your speed over the ground. Let me show you how to do that. Say you're up at 10,000 feet and the air temperature outside is 10 degrees below zero. If you look at the inner ring, the C ring, which is in white, you'll see, for example, 140 knots. That would be where the 14 is at about 230 on the dial face. That's your indicated airspeed. If you look up onto the black D ring just above it, you'll see your true airspeed is actually a little bit over 160 knots. 
That's what you use for your flight planning. Now, just as there's a difference between indicated airspeed and true airspeed, there's also a difference between indicated altitude and true altitude. The way an altimeter works is that you get a barometric reading from an airport near your current location. You then turn a dial on your altimeter to that barometric pressure, and the gauge will indicate what your altitude is. However, if the air around you is warmer or cooler, than the standard temperature and pressure at that altitude, that will affect your altitude reading, your indicated altitude reading. To get a true altitude reading, you have to first find out what your pressure altitude is. And to do that, you adjust your altimeter to 29.92 inches of mercury and read off the given altitude. That is your pressure altitude. Now to do this conversion, what you do is you look to the left, to the altitude computation window. The bottom is your altitude in thousands of feet, so I have it set up for 20,000 feet, and just above it, you put in the outside air temperature, in this case, zero degrees. Then you would look at the movable sea scale for your altitude based on your altimeter reading. We would then look up onto the D scale, which is the black scale. That's the true altitude versus the indicated altitude. Now, the only other thing that's of note on this side of the E6B is the conversion tables. Now, you notice at the bottom that you can convert degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. That's a pretty straightforward conversion. But you can also look up here, for example, right underneath the 10, we have statute miles. If we wish to convert statute miles to kilometers, all we have to do is line those two arrows up there at 1 o'clock. And then our statute miles will be on the white C scale, and the kilometers will be on the black D scale. So for example, if we come over here to 10 at, the th at about the 3 o'clock position, if you look where the 10 is on the white scale, look straight up, and you'll see it's a little over 160. And those are the functions of this side of the E6B. But wait, there's more. And we see the wind side of the E6B. This is for calculating crosswind, and its use is rather simple. Let's go ahead and have a look. Now you see, it has a movable inner ring, and it has a slidable speed scale. Now notice in the middle of the ring, there's a small blue dot. Say you have a wind coming out of 60 degrees at 20 knots. So what you would do is you would move your ring to put 60 degrees underneath the true index. Then you place that blue dot directly on 100 knots. Well, the wind is coming out of 60 degrees and it's at 20 knots, so we're going to make a mark at about 20 knots right there. Say we're flying north. So now we have that set up so that we have the crosswind component. Now what we have to do is check the speed. So say our speed is 150 knots. We would bring the end of that line to where it intersected 150 knots. And then we would read back to the dot to see that our true airspeed is 140 and that we have to make a six degree correction to our right in order to counter that crosswind out of the east. Well, folks, that's about all there is to an E6B. So that makes this a good overall introduction to the E6B flight computer. This is something that's of use to all flight students, and it's kind of a cool little thing to do. Now in part three of our series on selecting a slide rule for your personal use, we talked about advanced and specialty slide rules, including the E6B. And in that episode, I talked about the bezel ring on a pilot's watch, which is a mini E6B and I showed you a couple of tricks to using it. So if you like, that would be a good video to go check out now. So in the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by and visiting with me today. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe on your way out. And remember, I deeply appreciate our Patreons, PayPal donations, and channel members.